Hi, everyone, for another episode of The Daily Objective. Today, again, we have with us Raka Raka Ali, rapper, comedian, and intellectual curious student of objectivism. Hi, Raka. Hey. And the daily objective today is how we make sense of the past and history. And what triggered this uh, discussion that we're going to have is what we've seen happening in the last two weeks, which was a trend that was already on, but in the last two weeks it has, been, it has become big. And this is people trying to find elements from the past, which are supposedly uh, and often actually the remnants of a dark past, people who were immoral, who did immoral things, or other people who did some nice things, but also some bad things. And some people who looks like mostly did good things, but people don't know what they're doing anymore. So we had, for example, in Philadelphia, the vandalizing of a statue that was actually someone who was an abolitionist and someone who helped the emancipation of the slaves. But to, the, to begin this discussion, the first thing that I find often very difficult is how do we judge figures who are either in the present or in the past and who are symbols of something, but also have some particular flaws. So for example, when Kobe Bryant uh, tragically died and he was one of my heroes for some reasons, mostly his work ethic and his determination. So I had to write an obituary for Kobe on spy. And I was thinking, but how do you deal with someone whose life also had dark elements, who had, as far as we know, has done things that are immoral? So how do you think we should judge someone, a figure or a period? Do we focus on the good and say, well, forget all the bad? Or do we take everything into accordance and see where the balance is? I think when we're talking about historical figures, and this probably applies to celebrities contemporary as well, we look at what makes this person stand out in their context. So uh, being a slave owner in the 1700s doesn't make you stand out, but taking bold steps to change the way people think about liberty and implementing that and fighting for it does make you stand out. Um, just like when looking back at the history of philosophy, going all the way back to Greece, you know, like uh, a lot of people probably would say that, you know, Plato and Aristotle are a couple of slave owning uh, sexual deviance uh, with, a, with a poor view of, of women's integrity and women's rights. I would say, and you might agree, in their context, they were laying down the foundation. They were taking a bold new step in a, in a way that would allow us to enjoy so much liberty and progress and all of these things. So um, probably the same is true with Kobe Bryant. You know, I mean, um, I, we, we know him because he plays basketball, like because he, he excelled at basketball. We don't, we don't, you know, we're not, um, you know, we're not living next door to him. It's not really so that, but certainly with history, I would say what makes this person stand out. Right. And I think it would be an evasion if we wouldn't point to that. So, for example, with Thomas Jefferson, this quite often comes up. So, again, Thomas Jefferson, how, what else could you say if not one of the greatest men to ever walk this earth? And yet, his view on slavery, although even with that time standards, we could say it was relatively progressive from such a genius, from such a, an enlightened mind, you would say you'd prefer, you'd expect better. So I think it's an act of justice to say, look, obviously don't topple the statue because mostly you have nothing to replace it with morally or politically or whatever. But yeah, let's not forget this. But the issue of the statutes brings something else also in mind. And this is our relationship with history. And I don't know if you have noticed, but more and more history becomes more of a zoom out thing. So in the schools, for example, you say, uh, we'll have the history of the world, or we go more and more back in time to the pre-human history. And, the pro and there are two ways to see this. The one is that, this brings the universal message, like what is common in all of us, which is good. But quite often, like I grew up with uh, stories about battles of my ancestors. And you could say that's the parochial history because for example, they didn't teach us that when we beat the Turks in a specific battle, we chopped off their heads and we created the pyramid. But the thing is, when I was eight years old, would that have actually benefited me? 
Whereas by, by, by these history lessons, you at least put yourself within an axis of you know, good, evil, uh, we were enslaved and then we revolted, acts of virtue, acts of bravery. So do you think that this sometimes idealized sense of history, do you think that it has some merits or do you think that it should be no? It's, we have to be, you know, there's no good or bad, everyone is a bit gray. Look, it's never a bad idea to uh, unearth facts and to learn the truth. So it is worth uh, noting Thomas Jefferson, the good and the bad. And, you know, that, that is, I mean, that's, that's part of uh, being a student. But again, you, you look at them, you ought to look at them and emphasize what makes this person stand out. Like when it comes to um, the statue you mentioned that, you know, the statue was vandalized and then, oh, it turns out he was actually an abolitionist. I don't think it would have mattered to the vandals or their apologists, which are the intellectuals that are at the, uh, at the root of all of this. It would not matter to them if you said, well, this guy actually was one of the good guys. He was a, an abolitionist. They would say, okay, I don't care. He's still a white guy living back then. And their, their uh, collectivist worldview doesn't make room for kind of the an, a lone individual standing out um, and, and being kind of, you know, uh, being kind of a, an unlikely hero or being an abolitionist. He, he's still part of the white, uh, the white collective and also probably uh, had what, what uh, today's intellectuals would call latent racism. So even, even as an abolitionist, even someone like Abraham Lincoln, could have latent racism. Um, so not even realizing he's racist, but he's, he is racist in their view. So it, 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 this all really boils down to general philosophy. How do we view the nature of man? If we're value-driven individualists, if I'm approaching all these questions in terms of like, how can I live the best life possible for me? Then I'm looking at the past and I'm looking at all of these historical figures and I see Jefferson and Aristotle and and uh, various others, um, innovators as my lineage. Those are my ancestors and I, you know, uh, DNA be damned. But if I have this collectivistic view, if I have this uh, view of history where everyone's part of a group and the, the story of, of the group is metaphysically real and that's the real story, then of course um, I'm willing to throw a million abolitionist individuals into you know uh, uh, under the bus for the sake of correcting the injustice that was done to the group, the black group, or this group, or that group, or women, or any other. That's um, that's very interesting in two terms. One, I think it's very dangerous if people don't understand. So how did we find ourselves here? We find ourselves in a present, and what you just said, which is, well, I don't care what this person did, or you tell people, look, look slavery didn't only happen in the United States. Actually, it was the ideas of the founding fathers that made them, they say, I don't, I don't care about all that. What you end up with is individuals who find themselves in 2020, not having any idea, how did we end up here? How did you end up in Seattle or Philadelphia? What does it mean? What is your historical lineage? And that is important, not in terms of know what your tribal affiliation is, but it's important in terms of knowing how are you going to live your life and by what standards, for example. So why do we celebrate? Let's, let's take an, an even more, let me take it a bit further. Could it be sometimes, and I know I'm psychologizing here, that this is actually quite often an attack on achievement. And let me give you an example. I'll go back to history. Quite often we hear where we need to, hear, to, to learn the history of the common people. The history is not the history of the great men or women. And I get what this means, but quite often I think what is a trap which is behind it is to say, well, there are no great endeavors. What is important is how the mother next door uh, feeds the, the, the children, which could be a very virtuous endeavor, but that's not what necessarily history is. And what I see is that when you try to topple a monument, your attitude is the attitude that says, I will destroy. But to be in a monument, you have to do something. And many of the people who are in monuments, I realize have done bad things. But let's also keep into, into mind that 
there is something in, in this kind of aspiring, being in a pedestal in granite. And I think there's something almost anti-monument. It's not only, it's we basically need to tear these things because the past is, is not clean. Do you think I'm getting crazy here or do you think there's something to it? I think you're not crazy enough. Um, there's, uh, there's certainly nihilism at the root of all of, 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 all of this, but, but pure nihilism doesn't sell. Even in the mind of the intellectual who decides to be explicitly nihilistic, he still needs to sort of tie it to values. And certainly if you're going to sell nihilism to the masses, you know, it needs to be uh, marketed as value driven. And yeah, like going back and pulling down statues, it's done in the name of sort of implicit individualism. You know, the black individual who was oppressed by the, the figure that this statue represents. Um, People like uh, they 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 uh, like the rioters are are compared to the Boston Tea Party, saying, "Yeah, these people were fighting for freedom. That's what being American is all about." So you repeatedly see all these sort of appeals to uh, individualism, sort of implicitly and stuff like that. But ultimately, um, it is driven by nihilism. This is why it is ultimately a a battle of philosophy of fundamentals. We need to decide like what are values, how do I pursue them, should I pursue them, and then how does that manifest how does that look when done in real life and then we can look back at the founding fathers look if you tell people no the founding fathers they were laying down the foundation for abolishing slavery people that they just say well so what they they laid down the the foundation of capitalism and capitalism is racist and it enables racism and uh and the founding fathers they were rich white guys that didn't want to pay their taxes so what do i like what do you mean they 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 idea their ideas were good again against racism that's such a that's such a western mindset you have there they would say that you think ideas are what's important that you think philosophy has anything to do with that what has philosophy ever done for the africans they would ask you what 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 did the greeks ever do but steal from africa they would ask you so um and it ultimate yeah it's it's philosophical at the end of the day what is the nature of man and and how does that look for me firsthand what do i want how do i want to live and and then I, then I choose the philosophy that's going to sort of uh, facilitate that. So today looks like you are doing the deep thinking. I'll bring it a bit more to the surface. So yes. you did the philosophical heavy lifting. I'll, I'll, bring, I'll continue with a kind of cheap psychologizing. I think there's also a bit of narcissism there. The narcissism that says, I figured everything out. I don't need to deal and grapple with these very difficult questions. I don't even want to know what happened. I have these, these slogans or I, I have this, this kind of moral autonomy to go after these things, even though I don't know where they came from, what was, be, what was before that and what is after that. And you mentioned, you mentioned some of the founding fathers. Uh, David Boas, the guy who is, who is running, uh, who, or at least was running Cato, like he, he has written a book uh, on, uh, on classical liberals or something like that. And okay, I don't agree generally with the guy, but he has a nice kind of phrase there. He says, he's religious apparently. If I die and I go to my creator and he asks me, what have you done with your classical liberal ideas? And I say, I abolish slavery. I'll say that that's kind of good enough. Like what has your ideas achieved and what have your ideas accomplished? But the mere fact that they cannot make the link between like constitution, bill of rights, uh, liberal ideas, enlightenment, abolition of slavery is the problem. And another problem is that there is no challenge to them. What I found very interesting is that in the past, you would have some radicals trying to take down, for example, statues. But now what we see in the UK is that city councils, politicians, actually creating maps and creating, I don't know, maybe Excel files with all the statues and saying, Problematic, 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 problematic. So we see an establishment which is so uncomfortable with, with supporting anything that makes it, like why are you, why are you, what are you, for example, trying to conserve? I'm talking about conservative politicians. See how afraid they are to say, for example, why this statue should stay. The only thing they'll say is, uh, well, you know, patriotism, something like that they can't stand and defend the legacy of whatever they are supposed to defend. 
And that's why these days I see a lot of people uh, on Twitter saying, where is the right? Where are the conservatives? They are where they have always been, which is running away. Because to fight the weapon is ideas. And my question is, where are they, their ideas? And how can they defend this legacy without like buzzwords like patriotism, without fighting this, this, uh, this battle of ideas? They're, they've always been very uh, pathetic and they just cling to heritage and family. So if heritage is what it's all about, then of course the descendants of slaves and their sympathizers should tear down every statue of anyone who ever had anything to do with slavery. And, uh, and the Confederates or the, the descendants of the Confederates should have their statues as well because that's their family and that's all that matters, right? If ideas aren't what matter, then everyone should just cling to their ancestors and and their ancestors should live for their ancestors and ad infinitum. Um, by the way, I think um, Confederate statues, like there shouldn't be a public space in general, but like a, a, it, when the South lost the Civil War, they should not have been allowed to keep on uh, having their flags and their, like, their public statues after they lost the war. They should have been told that yeah, it, it's over. You guys lost. You cannot uh, parade this stuff anymore in the public, you know, in the public space. Um, but, but that doesn't mean that the mobs should then tear down these statues, uh, recklessly. It needs to be done in an orderly fashion. It needs to be done, uh, with, by, by with, a, with the process of, uh, using the law and agitating to have the statues removed. You know, the fact that all these people think like I alone can decide, you know, what gets to stay up and what I'm going to tear down. I get to decide what get, what's get canceled and I don't need to ever look to the wisdom of the ages. It's definitely the age of subjectivism we live in. But of course, that does not come about in a vacuum. It has its rich philosophic history going back to Kant, going back to Plato. I mean, mysticism has been among us and uh, these philosophers walk amongst us. So um, it's definitely the age of um, subjectivism and these, these fierce individualists, as they might see themselves, who are making the rules, dictating the rules. They really are carrying water for philosophers before them. In short, I just want to say I haven't seen um, Gone with the Wind. I don't actually know why it's offensive or how it's offensive, but you know, they say, oh, what are you trying to erase history? I don't think they're trying to erase history explicitly so much as, I mean, maybe that they're technically doing that, right? They're erasing history at the end of the day. But what they're also trying to do um, is change how we evaluate history. So that hence tearing down statues of not only Confederates, but also the good guys, the Northerners, the, the uh, you know, George Washington, who freed his slaves upon his death. At, when, at a time when I don't think he could have even freed them during his life legally. Um, and um, either they want to change how we evaluate the past. Now, by the way, like I said before, nihilism always needs to have something positive to cling to, to in order to be sold and in order to be palatable. So there is legitimacy to questioning. Well, are we evaluating the right historical figures? Are we looking at them correctly? Should we maybe apply our more rational values to the past? So um, as an individualist, I can look back at Attila. You know, I can look back at uh, Genghis Khan with a very negative view. I don't need to revere them just because they're achievers in history, right? So there is a legitimacy to looking back and saying, let's rethink how we look at history. However. If you have been paying attention, what matters most is what is the standard you're bringing? What is the philosophy guiding you? And as an individualist, as a man of science, as a man of reason, um, I think long live Thomas Jefferson, long live George Washington. Uh, let's move the Confederate statues over to the Museum of History so we don't need to smash them, but we certainly don't, we, they, they should not be uh, paraded proudly because they lost the war and good and rightfully so they lost the war of ideas the way I see it as well and um, with all that being said and without further ado I think it's time we wrap this up we are uh, I think two minutes past the ending time uh, thank you Nikos the last of the Greeks as he's been called and most of all thank you to the audience we want to see this project grow we want to see, we've got 
uh, Lord Emperor over there. Um, he is a man, I think, of Persian descent. So we've got a representative of Persia, of um, Greece, and of Africa, Jerusalem. Really just, just all the ancients here at once. I'll stop filibustering now and say goodbye 